All right, what is up, guys? Here we go, episode seven of All Access, the photography podcast. We've made it to seven episodes. I hope to have a lot more. Guys, today we have a very special episode. Today's guest is my longtime friend. You guys probably know him as Germ9. He was one of the first people to really embrace me and talk to me and get to know me early on in this hobby when I started in 2012. Uh, Germ was a big name at the time, still is, but he's moved on to some other things. But at the time, Germ was one of the biggest names in the local urban exploring community. And I can't stress this enough that, you know, when you're up and coming and when you're getting started in a hobby and you've been doing it for a while, you cannot forget the people who were there for you at the beginning and who really helped you out. And I cannot stress this enough. Germ's a very interesting guy and I think you guys are going to like him. He's going to have a lot to talk about. And I, I have a few questions lined up, but I really think I want to just do this one on the fly and see how it goes. So here we go, guys. Germ 9, episode 7. Let's go. Hey guys, before we start, real quick, just so you know, the first 10 minutes or so, my audio is pretty messed up because here's what I did. When I started talking to Germ, my microphone was over here, so here I am having a great conversation with Germ, and I'm not actually talking into the microphone. And then when I realized I wasn't talking to the microphone, I moved it. So at about the 10 minute mark, my audio gets better. I'm going to do what I can in post-processing to try and fix my own audio for the first 10 minutes, but bear with me. I will sound much better in about 10 minutes. Now, let's go. All right, guys, here we go. Episode 7, like I said, very excited to have my longtime friend, uh, Germ9. Can I still call you Germ9 or is it Jeremy? You can call me Germ. <laughs> it just comes out so easily for me these days. It's still a part of me. I feel like I go by J9 these days mostly. J9. Okay, that's interesting. All right, I'm going to say Germ because it's just easier for me. That works. Um, so we met back in 2012 when I first started in this hobby, and uh, one of the reasons why I'm having Germ on the podcast is because I believe very strongly that you should not forget about those who helped you when you first started doing anything, those who helped you when you were coming up. Uh, Germ was great at giving me advice, really embraced me as a new person to this hobby, gave me advice, gave me tips, we became good friends, we explored it quite a few times, and have stayed in touch over the years. So if you do not know the name Germ9, all you got to do is start Googling abandoned places in Ontario and his blog Journalism will come up, which is journalism.blogspot.com. I'm going to talk quite a bit more about that. But Germ, thanks a lot for joining us on the podcast today. It's my pleasure, brother. It's nice to see you thriving and, and pushing so hard. It's been a blast, man. It's one of those hobbies where, you know, people come, people go. Uh, but for me, it's just kind of been my thing. And... Uh, you know, someone said to me the other uh, in a recent podcast that his vision of me is of someone who is always looking for the next thing to do or having the next idea, the next project. And I have a point that I feel that way about you, that, you know, the time that I've known you, you are you're always doing something right, whether it's your street art or stencils or, you know, the, the, the post office boxes that you were doing. Um, oh, all your ideas, like you're always doing something. Am I right? For sure. It goes in waves for me. Like I admire that about you. It's like a, it's like a hockey player or somebody who really pushes himself, a, a guitarist, anybody who really kind of goes hard at that one thing. And then they go so hard. My attention just doesn't last that long. I find, I find like I'm, I'm making music and a few years in I'm craving something else. So I'm just the type of person who goes all in on whatever I'm doing. It just seems to be that whatever I'm doing just keeps shifting and I'm getting better at, at just accepting that and rolling with whatever comes. Right. So, okay. So now the reason why you are here is because we met through the hobby of urban exploring. And uh, I mean, we can go, we can go a million different directions in this conversation, but what was it back in, I guess, 2008, it looks like, um, when you really started getting into exploring abandoned places? What got you into it? Um, it was funny, really. My wife and Nicole and I had been in Vancouver for six or seven years, and it had been all about street art and graffiti. And out there, street art and graffiti took us to abandoned buildings. And before that, as I was growing up, my dad was like this weird cat who would take us to the dump for something to do or stop at every abandoned house and look around. You know, it was just like, so I've, I've always been going to those places through other interests or other, you know, parts of life. It just happened living in them as a teenager. When I was on the run, I would sleep in abandoned places. So when we came back from Vancouver kind of was 
I had said what I wanted to say for the moment in, with street art and Nicole and I walked up to this, this old hospital in Peterborough. My mom used to work at called St. Joseph's hospital. And I don't know why I just said, I just said, uh, hang on a second. And I walked up and I opened the door and it was open and it, it was like, the sun was literally going down. It was like minus 35 outside. And something about the two of us walking around that abandoned hospital as the sun went down, it was pitch black. And there was something that happened in both of us where we went home that day after spending that time in the hospital and we found all these urbexers and we heard about, you know, Muskoka sand and all these places. And I, of course my obsessive side took over and I just all of a sudden had to see them all. So I was, yeah, I was, I was in the all in state, but this, and there was this, this feeling of like my abandonment issues is what I called the blog. And it really was about that. I felt like, at home in these places. There was something going on in my soul at the time where I felt really lost and left behind. And I really identified with these empty spaces that people just didn't give a fuck about because it's how I felt at the time. So that was like intrinsically pulling me to explore those places day after day after day. And it was literally obsession. That's obsession awesome. at that stage. Definitely. And you, when you look at your blog and you go through, uh, you had 51 entries in 2011. And then 2012, you peaked at 68 entries to your blog in wow. 2012. So you kind of see that you started 2008 and you're doing some more street art stuff. And you get into exploring 2008 or 2010, 2011, 2012, you peak and then you drop down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And then you, uh, your last entry was in 2016. So a question about your blog. Uh, so you've sort of abandoned it. It's still there. But uh, why don't you contribute to it anymore? I think we, I think all of us are doing these things. Like I think anybody who has a podcast or is, is inactive with art or anything, we're doing it for our own reason. It's inside and we don't always really necessarily understand it. And, um, I, I still go to ab abandoned buildings. I still explore abandoned buildings. There was just something about that stage in my life where I really needed to use that process that I was going through with writing about the process and the whole, the whole thing. It was just this cathartic thing that I was doing. And I think just like anything, you make enough songs about something or you repeat the process of healing or exploring or whatever it is, you get to a point where you've achieved the, the goal that you wanted. I felt I got what I needed out of it. And my soul kind of moves on to whatever's next to to, to satiate right. that hunger inside me because like I go so hard at something that after after a little while you have to make the choice am I going to perfect this and this is the thing I'm going to do forever or am I going to do something else like right now I'm just riding e-bikes around endlessly having a good old time so like you know what I mean uh, there was yeah. a part of my a part of me that was really hurting back then and I used that blog to to talk that through and to work that through and to share what I was feeling with people like you and yeah. it really helped me. And when I got to that place where I started going to therapy and dealing with what I had learned about myself through that process, it didn't be, it's not as important. I, I don't, I don't need anybody to feel my pain anymore because I've processed it, I guess. Right. That's good. And, and I definitely do. And we'll get to the mental health side of things a little bit later, but I definitely feel a different vibe from you, whether it's, you know, through our texting or through your posts online or even right now, you feel different. You sound different than you did back then. And you've obviously been through quite a journey. But again, we'll, we're, we're going to touch on that in a little while. Um, just pause for a second and see where I was going to go next. Um, so um, talking about your, your blog and the fact that it's still up, I have people message me quite often. And they'll send me uh, uh, one of your blog entries. And they'll say, have you been here? Is this place still there? Or... Uh, or, you know, somebody will say, oh, I found this awesome location on the, on Germ's website and, uh, you know, you should go check it out. I'm like, I've already been to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great. Your blog is still giving. It's still giving to the community. And, and That's you know, good to hear. I haven't logged into it probably since that last post. I think you said 2016. Yeah. So that, that's good to hear. I get messages is, every year from Flickr that they're going to start charging me if I don't, but I just ignore that. And so far, all the posts are still up. So they are, and you're, uh, it's great. It's like your your blog and your Flickr are such a time capsule, if you will, of a time in your life. And that was an important time in my life when I met you. And it's great to go back and look, especially going through your Flickr. And it's like, oh yeah, I remember that place. And and uh, it's almost like a similar time because back then it was you we are. Flickr and maybe one or two other sites that we would share on. 
Now, holy fuck, man, it's everything. Like, when I'm out exploring, and, you know, I explore for myself, but I also obviously to do the content, as many of us do. And it's like, you know, I do content for YouTube, for my Facebook. Now, my Facebook and my Instagram are typically the same content. But then you got Insta Instagram Reels, and you have Facebook Reels. And, you know, the way I am, I kind of embrace anything that's new or social, and I'll try it. And then there's so, it's just, it's so much more work now. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> to put your yeah, stuff out there. You're right. It was so simple back then for me. All I wanted to do was like practice writing and take photographs and have the explorations. And it was this perfect process. Right. And it's just, see, I'm not, and people don't, I don't really talk about this ever, but like, I don't look at social media. There's like maybe 20 or 30 people who I'll look up yourself included and see what you've been up to by name recently. But I, it's been over a decade that I've actually looked at social media and just scrolled a page. Like it doesn't happen. So I don't, I don't really, uh, I don't keep up with all that stuff. Like there's literally maybe five explorers that I still look at to see kind of what they're doing. And I, there's other people like Sean Galbraith who I'll stay in touch with, you know, he might not post Boring anymore, but he's such an incredible human being that I met through this. That it's like you, I have to stay in touch. And you know, there's there's more there than an exploring. You know what I mean? It's like with you, there's more of a bond between us than than just we explored some houses together. You know what I mean? So it's like that. That's my favorite thing about that whole part is from the urbex side and the website stuff. Is there's like a small handful. Lachlan's another one. Like I have the utmost respect for Lachlan. I just think he's the raddest dude. You know, so it's that's that's the thing that when I look back at the the UER side of it, as you say, or the you know that that social community, because I remember when I first came in, it was all everyone posts boats, let's drown this guy, fuck this guy, like they attack me endlessly. You know, if my ego was weaker, I would have collapsed. Many people probably do under that pressure because they were complete assholes. But there was people like Sean and Lachlan and yourself a little bit later after that when you came in that were like really you know interesting good people who were who were like hey don't worry about them you know what i mean there was a small and to me that's i guess that's the biggest difference you're talking about the difference in me from then to now those that's what i see now back then i used to see the bad and the hate and just how many of them there were and now i can just sit back and appreciate the daves and the lachlan's and the sean's you know what i mean Totally. And Lachlan was so he's always such a good guy. And like, he's the kind of guy who every year we say, let's get together this year and let's actually do it. But then we never do. And, yeah. but he's, and he's always standing up for people. Like he's yeah. always been so good at coming in and so eloquently making an, an argument for somebody to defend them. And he's all, I've always respected him for that. And, uh, He's a great guy. Same thing with Sean. I'm, I'm, I'm considering having Sean on the podcast cause he's still pretty active and like keeping in touch. Obviously, like you said, he's moved on, but you know, when you talk about like the OGs and the guys from, you know, before we started, uh, Sean's one of them. And I think I'd like to get him on and, and get, I cause like if, if I, before you go, if I ever had a Beatles moment while I was, while I was exploring, I was at, Oh man, I forget what this, I think it was linseed oil in Toronto. And I recognized yeah. Sean from the roof because of the hat that he always wore back then. <laughs> I, I was yeah. like, Oh my God, it's John Lennon. Like that's, it was this moment <laughs> because he was the OG. Like, yeah, he was the, he was the one who, you know, and he's always been, so he's been good to me. He's, he's a wonderful person. Good. That's good. You should, yeah, I, you I should bring him on. He's also incredibly interesting. He is. He's a very smart, interesting guy. And uh, yeah, I think I will have him on. But it's funny talking about back then, like, you know, wh whatever, whatever generation we're in of exploring, where you got like the originals and then yourself came along and then me and then up to where it is now. There's so much that stays the same, though. Like there's so much of the bullshit that was going on then that still goes on now, like location sharing, name dropping. And then, you know, you talked about you entered exploring through the through street art and and graffiti and yeah. i i have the opinion and i haven't always had this opinion but my opinion now is that street art and graffiti and exploring go hand in hand no, and, no question about it right like everywhere we go there's graffiti yeah and everywhere graffiti artists go there's photographers or curious people it's just it's like this this dark side underworld that we live in <laughs> and i I used to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, graffiti and, and vandalism and all this shit. But as I get older, it's like, it's all the same. We you know we're, you know, we're kicking in doors, we're breaking into places and <laughs> we're taking pictures. Somebody else is kicking in a door and putting spray paint on the wall. I can, I really like some good, thoughtful graffiti. 
You know, to me, it doesn't even have to be that even like to me, it's all part of the story. Like mm-hmm. you don't get to pick and choose in life. You don't get to be all happy and no sad, right? Nobody gets yeah. to wake up and go, I'm going to be all happy and not experience sadness ever. You don't get to choose yeah. that. So when you go and exploring abandoned buildings, it's not that the graffiti is there. That's the problem. It's how people react to the graffiti. That's the problem. Because if you're going to see an abandoned house and photograph what nature and man have time have done to it, and you're getting angry about one of the parts of what's <laughs> done, been done to it, that's yeah. on you. That's a reflection of what you're feeling and thinking, not, you know, someone else is just going through it. You know what I mean? To me, To me, a vine growing through a broken window is just as fitting and and uh, in place as a tag or anything else, because because we don't own these places. It's like me as a street artist. When I put a piece of street art up and somebody else fucks with it, I don't get to complain because I put it up in public space or as place no one cared about. Right. So I've always seen it that way. Like you don't get to. It just, it's not how life works. We don't get to pick no. and choose our emotions. We don't get to pick and choose what parts of things. We get to choose what to appreciate and what to hate. Yeah. But the more energy yeah. you want to spend on hating something, because I've had haters my whole my whole life and I'm having a good time here and I don't know where they're at. You know what I'm saying? So it doesn't. <laughs> yep, totally. Yep. So the graffiti, and I, the, I love the, the I love the haters. If you hate it. Yeah. The graffiti doesn't care if you hate it. No, it doesn't. And I remember you're one of the first examples I had at just someone being fucking attacked, especially on, uh, back on UER. And like you were so hated by so many people, but you always came back and I loved it. Like you never you never bowed down and you never, you know, gave in. And you're like, I'm me. I'm unapologetically me. Fucking deal with it, Skyann. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, pretty much. and she would attack you and people would attack you. And and then me looking Sky forward Anne. now. Oh, that name in a while. Right. <laughs> I, I, was going through, well, genuinely. I was doing some uh, research last night, going through some old posts and I saw some stuff of her coming after you. And um, I think she's grown quite a bit. She's still a little angsty and angry, but she's, uh, she's come along and she's still doing it. She's still out here. But anyways, beyond that. Um, well, that's good. I hope she's well. I don't wish any think, of those haters anything bad, man. Like I get it. Some people are in a place and something triggers them. I get it. I've been triggered yeah. before. I don't own other people's shit. Like since I was 14, I've been like me, take it or right. leave it. And if yeah. you don't like it, you're probably going to do all of this. And then I'm just going to keep coming. Who's who you're wins keep in that going. scenario? Who wins in that scenario where I keep coming unapologetically in me and you get triggered over and over? That's the way I always <laughs> saw it. So it didn't seem like an attack on me ever. It seemed like an attack on, on themselves. They wanted to have a bad day. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm yeah. still grooving. I was writing blogs and exploring buildings and having a good mm-hmm. old time with my wife. That's right. And, you know, talking about vandalism and graffiti, like there was a place I found in well, 2012, there was this church I found on a native reserve uh, in the six nations. And uh, when I first went in summer of 2012, I took some pictures of it and it had not been used since the nineties and it was in pretty rough shape. Well, I decided to go back every year and take the same pictures every year. And I have pretty much a 10 year progression of this place. And Mother Nature is more of a vandal than anyone uh, that I've seen in this hobby. No doubt. Like nobody fucked with this church. There's been there was no graffiti, no vandalism. Nobody stole shit. You know, big giant leather Bible stayed there for all 10 years. All the pews were still there. But gradually the floor starts sinking the ceiling starts dropping the floors start coming in and then last year it didn't survive the winter and it collapsed on itself and you know you can't really get mad at somebody for vandalizing something because it's gonna fucking happen anyways <laughs> for sure i mean <laughs> you can't I mean, there's a perfect example right here i mean all right you remember that place? I don't know if you ever went to a place called Standard Chemical. It's up near Howard. No, I never went there. It's like, it's basically just this concrete shell. Not much to it, but as the summer comes on, nature takes over and it just looks like this jungle growing over concrete pillars. Uh, this is a photo from that place with this, uh, okay. the, the classic red chair and this filigree graffiti. It turned this place that just was this boring place. And this, I've had this picture since then. This is like 2011 I took this. And like, to me, yep. the filigree, that beautiful graffiti, it made this place come alive. And when I took the picture totally. of this, people wanted to go there because they saw that. And it was the right. art, the beauty. And if people can't go in and write garbage and do stupid stuff, artists won't go and do the good stuff. 
like in right. Linseed and Canada Malt in Montreal, where you have legendary graffiti writers making yeah. a work of art out of a shell. Same with like uh, Barber Paper Mill. Barber. Barber Paper Mill would suck if it wasn't for all that graffiti. There's some great there? artwork there. Is that, that still there? Barber? Yep. I yep. should go back. You should. It's great. It's easy to get into. Oh, so I'll go um, back with my stencil just for the UER crowd. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I remember I was in Kingston at the old uh, racetrack and I saw your name so many times stenciled on all the walls. <laughs> Dude, I got just before Lee got legalized, I was parked inside there with a quarter pound in my pocket and we got caught and they called the cops on us. It was a quarter pound of mushrooms. It was the yeah. freakiest. It was one of my uh, scariest exploring moments. Oh, wow. Shit. Yeah. Okay, so, so let's shift gears a little bit then. We talked about your exploring, and you are an absolute uh, open book when it comes to your mental health. Um, so how are, how are you doing? And, you know, how, you know, you've talked about, like, you know, the, your, your, your condition and your state causing you to really obsess on something and then move on. Um, so how, how is your mental health these days? And tell the listeners a little bit about what you've been through. Um, yeah, I don't like labels. So some of the language that I use might sound a bit quirky, but it's, it works sure. for me. Um, yeah, whatever. So I experience symptoms that are most often referred to as bipolar disorder, as well as borderline personality disorder, severe mm -hmm. anxiety and depression, blah, blah, all of that. So it's been a, a a large struggle for a lot of my life, but over the past 10 years, I've taken more responsibility, I guess, on understanding it and working a lot about, you know, therapy and, and you know, really developing some honed in self-awareness and starting to really have a better understanding of what I'm going through, what it all feels like and how to process it healthier. So I'm in a much better place now. Like I'm on a minimal amount of, of dose of, of medication so that I, cause I don't like being a zombie. I'm, you know, yeah, creative, artsy, fun type of breath. So, mm -hmm. but overall, I mean, I'm right now. I'm kind of in a mid manic state, so I have like more energy than most people. I don't sleep very much. I hyper focus on things. Uh, I have too much energy, so stuff like that. But that's just where I am. Just an assessment of this moment. But yeah. overall, in the in the big picture, doing very well. You know, this year I've been doing uh, traveling and all sorts of things I've never done before, and just really trying to most of my you know evening energy goes to like meditation and mindfulness exercises and just kind yeah. of the opposite of everything that was chaotic and epic back then is just right. chill and relax these days that's great and you sound like you've got and i've met her but you've got a fantastic partner who has stuck with you through highs and lows and uh it almost sounds like you know if, if it wasn't for her support you know we might not be talking today oh there's no question I met yeah. her, I had just done two years in jail as a young offender when I met her and I was like ready to just do coke till I died. Like I was ready to just get out and end the shit that's as violently as possible. Like, yeah, and I just, when I met her, it inspired me to like grow into the type of person that she would actually want to spend her life with. And yeah. that <laughs> slowly made me actually want to live a life and it all just kind of developed. But yeah, like 26 years we've been together and there's no question she's, I don't believe in God, but she's my savior. She, she's the yeah. light that inspires me to do every single thing that I do. That's great. And having, having met her that time, I came, I came to visit. It's, it's amazing the difference between the two of you, because you are you, the you that I've always known. And then there's this yep. sweet, angelic <laughs> woman that's in the room with you. And she's just so quiet and she's just there. Doesn't yeah. say a whole lot, but <laughs> yeah, she's well, she talks, she calls herself Ninja because she gets a lot done, but she does it in the background. That was always her street art nickname. And, yeah. Uh, she's, yeah, she's 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 my everything, man. I don't know. There's there's no there's no me. There's no germ nine. There's no music, art, happiness. Like none of that comes if I didn't meet her. I was like a lost, tortured little boy in a man's body when I met her, and she loved me back to life for sure. That's great, and that's that's important. You need a good, solid woman to set you straight, to you know, to keep you in line, but to also let you do your shit that you're gonna do. You know, a lot of, a lot of women out there and I'm not, I'm not bashing on women, but a lot of women try to change their guys, you know, and doing stuff like what you do and what I do. A lot of women will be like, you know, you know, you can't break the law. You can't do that. But you know, I'm lucky to have a wife who gets it. She gets how important this is to me. For and sure. that if I don't have this, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> this is my outlet. This is, yeah, this is it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. No, Nicole, I mean, 
I get it. it. It can't be easy, but there's been times like with the street art stuff. I mean, I, I beat the charges. They didn't convict me of anything, but there was a time I was up on 13 charges of, for public mischief and, you know, getting calling her at three in the morning saying, I just got arrested again. Can you come pick me up? And, right. and literally it's, it still seems strange to me, but her response was, is always just so grounded and in the moment and understanding like no judgment at all. And that's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. We're two different people with a common bond of living and loving together forever. And, yeah. you know, you know, it's just it's, totally get it. So to totally. me, it was, to, from the outside, it, it must look foreign and strange to people at times, I guess, because we are so different. <laughs> it, it would appear, but no, we're, we're one unit. You know, that's great. And congratulations. I'm happy for you both. Thank um, you. I was just, you know, yesterday for the first time in years, I watched that documentary love song for the apocalypse and I'm going to link it to the people that are watching. Cause it's so well done. And man, watching you guys go through the Graham house brought through so brought back so many memories. Cause I only have pictures of that house. I don't, I have a visual, you know, video in my head of what it was like. And I have my pictures, but actually seeing that those rooms again, you know, moving, it was so good to watch. And that, you know, you have to agree that was probably one of the best houses that has ever been out there. Yeah, definitely. I, I have trouble watching that movie because there's moments I can see that I was so manic and it, it, so there's, there's been moments when I'm watching that where it's hard to watch. Because, right. Right. I don't know. It's like, Imagine some uncomfortable moment from your past and then sit down with the family to watch it together. <laughs> to watch it. Yeah, I get it. I get it. So, yeah. But, but uh, like David Ridgen, again, David Ridgen's a legend. Like if you, if you, the viewer don't know who David Ridgen is, the guy who, who made that movie, he's doing, mm-hmm. done such important work in his documentary career. And he's a fucking Canadian legend and such an awesome person. And that, that whole process with him and I and Nicole on the road exploring all yeah. those places was a dream come true and phenomenal and to have Bravo funding it. Like it just felt so surreal. Oh, crazy. Yeah. And being with David was just, he was so interesting. He was so, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know the word for it, man. He was just to watch him work while filming. Yeah. Me, like I was trying to, you know, be the guy who's getting filmed, but still just watching how, in- yeah. 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 So I had, I had to go to that first, but that Graham house, that's, I think you called it, someone called it the time capsule house, right? Yeah, we call it a time capsule house. Yeah. And that was yeah. the first time I had heard that term as like a, someone officially labeling an Ontario house with that. Uh-huh. And, uh, it was, it was mind blowing. I was really like uh, nervous while I was there. Cause we'd driven like four hours or something to get to it. We got the crew with us. Like we're yeah. doing a documentary. So like, yeah. And my manic energy is just like fucking electric. Uh, but the house itself was phenomenal. And I, I'm trying to think as I'm talking since you asked, and I can't think of a house that even comes close. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I know I've done a lot of houses since then, but that one, and I don't know if it's because it was my first or, or what, but, uh, and the good news about it all is that the house has been completely reclaimed by the woman who, who lived there, who owns it. And uh, I've, I've actually gone by the house four times trying to catch her, to talk to her. Uh, I've taken pictures of the outside of the house. She's fixing the roof. She fixed the windows. She completely gutted and renovated the inside of the house. Uh, it's completely livable. You're like the condition that it was in back then to what it looks like now. But I really want to talk to her and find out like, you know, what did you do to this house? And like, first of all, give like an apology for <laughs> what we did back then and, and talk to her about how she reclaimed the house and what she's done. But she's never home when I go there. So. Mm. maybe one day another one i always wonder about that i never heard the finale on like did it burn down or what is that fern the cat lady house oh yeah it burned down it yeah it, uh, it was uh reportedly it was an arson i think it was february 2016 um it burned down now so mm. what it sat there for you know for years and then someone had bought it and uh, so it burned down and the fire was so bad that the fire department just had to stand and watch. There's actually a photo of like six firefighters just watching the house burn because they couldn't do anything about it. And, um, the next day I went by and it was completely flattened. And within a few months, a new build started going up. <laughs> oh yeah, That's <laughs> so, Put two and two together there. Yeah. So yeah, now there's a brand new, beautiful mansion up in its place, but, uh, that was a really good one. Um, my first actual discovery of, of, a, of an amazing house for me. That was a big one for me. That was you? But, the um, one? Yeah, I found it. Yeah. 
Nice. Yeah. Summer I 2012. I have a bad memory, so all that stuff, I, I never yeah. remember the small details of stuff like that. <laughs> That's yeah. cool. Nice. That was a great find. That, that one really sticks out in my mind, like when I was in that house just being like, where the fuck am I? Like, uh-huh. Like, yeah, we went to that one together. You mean that? Yeah, you, me, and Dallas were in that one together. Right. So, okay, so, so I, this is a good segue. So we talked about the Graham house and we talked about the Cat Lady house. What were some of your favorites from, uh, from your days of exploring that you can remember? Man, there's so many. Rockwood <laughs> Lunatic Asylum. I've probably been in it 300 times. Like, yeah. stayed the night four or five times been chased out of there, smashed cell phones there, like just so much. Yeah. So much has gone right and wrong at Rockwood Lunatic Asylum. Same. I've had the same oh. experiences as you there. <laughs> yeah. Prison for women in Kingston as well. Like You were the first. I was, yeah. Yeah. I cracked that baby. Yep. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Don't fucking tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, See, the thing was that you got in – and then nobody got in for years. And then all of a sudden it opened up and fucking everybody got in. Yeah. But when, after you were in there, I was like, I saw your pictures and I was like, fuck, I got to get in there. Do you remember and, the fire escape? Yep. Yep. See, back then there was the fire escape and then they cut it off. Yep. <laughs> they cut the fire escape off after we went in, I think. I yeah. No, it was, um, it's, it's, uh, it's still just as good as it was. I mean, it's even better in there now because there's more decay, more peeling paint. We should go back there together. Oh, we should. That's a great yeah. idea. Relive that. I spent uh, two nights in there a couple of years ago. Uh, 2017, I did a road trip. And I, I used that. Yeah, I used it as like my uh, my home base for a whole weekend. <laughs> and some teenagers came in when you were in the solitary cells in the basement. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So you got Rockwood. You got Prison for Women. What else? Oh, my God. The- the first trip to Muskoka Sam with Nicole was legendary. We had the ice cleats up the fucking oh, stairs yeah. and just that was there's a there's a house near me too. There's nothing special about it, but right near my cottage, it's called the Van Steenberg Farm. Yes. And it used yeah. to have like just thousands of license plates and the, the son was autistic and everyone would call him Van and they would take him into town and he would recognize everyone in town by their license plate and he would say their wow. plate instead of their name. And I always That's thought that crazy. was so fantastic. But yeah. I have a cottage just up the road, so I stopped there endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. So yeah. I've been watching that place slowly decay for like 13 years. So Very cool. So got to be high on the list, yeah. There's just <laughs> too many, man. Like, I mean, camping on the roof of Burwash Prison – legendary uh being inside that pork factory in toronto while the bulldozers were demolishing it and i'm just Uh standing outside as the walls are being torn down i didn't know it was being (laughs) torn down and i'm inside and all of a sudden the walls start coming down (laughs) that one that was pretty legendary when i fell through the floor oh my god i can't remember them all there's yeah (laughs) this this rainbow of amazing memories of all these places that just yeah yeah It's like other people want to go stand in line and go to do something. I just want to be like in the weirdest spot doing my own thing. I'm still that. It's just. Yeah. It's funny. You know, you're bringing up places that a lot of people are still going to now or, or at least trying to. And you you know, then I always read about people, Oh, you're name dropping and and, you know, you're going to blow it up for everyone. So nobody can go. Well, I mean, you hit Rockwood years ago. I've done Rockwood three times since. And I've posted it and uh, yeah, I blew it up too, but I did, I went back a couple of years later, other people have been able to get in. It's much harder these days, but, and then same thing with like prison for women, you know, you got in there, you posted about it. To Nobody me, else got me, in there. To me, Dave, that's, it's just selfish. It's, yeah. it's, it's like this human, like self-preservation thing we have. There won't be enough for me. You're going to ruin it for me. I don't give a fuck about you. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, there, yeah. there are, and, and I'm not even going to like play coy about it. There are tons of people from urbexers to graffiti writers to people who are looking for a place to crash who have used my abandonment issues, journalism blog to find buildings in Ontario endlessly. And I'm glad right. I listed all of the names and told you where it was and did all the research and gave you everything you need to know with hidden pictures mm-hmm. of POEs. Don't give a shit. <laughs> You don't get to decide. You, it's, it's just like the hierarchy in graffiti. To a certain degree, I respect that. But it comes to a certain level where we're out here breaking the law. Fuck your rules. The point of this is fuck your rules. Yeah. 
when, when I'm tagging a wall, it is literally an act of fuck your rules. So right. I'm not going to be like, hey, you're tagging wrong beside me. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's okay with chalk on the wall to show that you broke into a place illegally. <laughs> But what I'm doing with a Sharpie is fucking sin. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I know, None I know. that has ever landed with me. I just see it as people, the people it's, it shows to me the inside of a selfish person, a person who sees the world in a way where there's not going to be enough for them if everyone gets fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, that's not mm-hmm. how I see the world. You know, see the a world lot of it is here. like, you want this? Keep your, ear to the, keep your ear to the ground. And like, you know, where, I mean, the, the problem we have, we're having now is that there's so many more people doing it now. And, you know, you've got so many people that are very loose lipped with stuff posting, you know, there's these fucking idiots right now that are big on posting exteriors with the address and then tagging the city. So now there's so many people, there's so much more access to locations through social media that when we were in it and there was a handful of us on UER, you know, or like a gaggle of us on the other site. That would all go to the same. Now, fuck man, it's thousands. It's hundreds we, and it's thousands. We did that. Yes, we did. <laughs> we did. When the first person steps over the line, other people watching think, hey, if that guy can do it, I can do it. And they'll go further over the line. It's like the broken right. window theory. The window breaks. Yeah. The next guy thinks it's okay to sell crack. The next guy robs a guy. Like it's the broken yeah. window theory. So, yeah, and, and it's uh, it's really hard to contain something now. And it's almost like if you don't want, you know, if you don't want it to blow up, then don't fucking post it. But if I post something, I take full responsibility for somebody finding some nugget of information in my post, whether it's a street sign off in the distance that they can blow up and read or, you know, whatever. Um, anyways, we're, we're dealing with the same bullshit now that was going on back then. But anyways, but we talked about what, what, I'm like I'm, I'm outside of the, I'm outside of like the group. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't, yeah. I don't, I'm not in these circles anymore. So yeah, well, I, I don't understand why it matters. I didn't understand then and I don't understand mm-hmm. now. And this is why they attacked me so bad back then, because I'm right. the type of person who, if a rule doesn't make sense to me, I'm asking, excuse me, why is this rule like this? Or I'm breaking right. it. So I, I still don't understand why, like, why it's okay to draw a line anywhere. If you're posting your stuff and trying to hide things perfectly, that's you, you drawing the line where you think the line should be drawn. But True. why does anybody in Urbex think that they have the right to tell someone else to do it differently? That's like me robbing banks and telling you, you can't use a Mossberg bitch. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm like we're both robbing banks. Use whatever gun you want. Right, right. So to me, I, 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 I still don't understand the absurdity of that part of the community where there's this thought where how far I'm crossing the line is the right way to do it. And it's gone too far that they're doing it a different way. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and it, I mean, because I'm still so fucking deeply entrenched in all of this, I still have this sort of thinking of, you know, some locations I'm fine to blow up. I don't care. Some You know, like back in the day when we all tried to keep the Graham house so secret and then it blew up where I'm kind of at in all of this is like, it's going to happen anyways. You know, I kind of want, you know, if I find something cool, I'm going to go and check it out. And like you said, for me, for me, for me, then I want to be able to let my friends go. Okay, you guys, here's a place you guys might want to go to the five of you who I share places with. Well, then those five are going to, I'm going to share it with two each, two each, two each. Next thing you know, everybody goes. Exactly. And, and you can't control it. You, and I, I don't know why you're, you know, you know, you're right because I am still a sort of obsessing over this and no location in the history since I've started this has really remained a hundred percent secret. They all get out <laughs> somehow. I still have one that I see and that it is this way. I still have one. No one knows where it is. Right. I'm the only <laughs> one who knows where it is. It's, yeah. I go to it once every two or three years. Nobody knows because it's right. like you can't get snitched on if no one knows what you did, right? If you tell right. two right. of your homies what you did, you have two already risks. But yep. if you don't tell anybody, it never happens. So that's right. Like, mm-hmm. do I did I care if people went to Rockwood and Muskoka when I posted it or St. you know the hospital in Peterborough? Yeah. I really didn't. Yeah. It didn't I just wanted to tell the story of the building because I thought the story was worth telling. That's why I right. called it journalism because it was me yeah. trying to do this journalistic approach, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. 
I, I always found that, and I find the same with graffiti and street art world, and it gets me a lot of heat there too, or it did when yeah, it mattered, yeah. you know, because I don't, I don't think people who are breaking rules should be judging other people for how to break the same rule. To me, it's I to, I, we're all criminals. I get it. And I will continue to laugh at people from UER to anyone else who wants to talk about it now, because no one, yeah. no one has made that point valid to me yet. No one has said it's no one, even what, even using me, no one has been able to say, Hey germ, that place I trespassed at had your spray paint in it. What you did was wrong. Okay. I'm listening. <laughs> Anybody in the comments, tell me how wrong I was. I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, I've had this discussion with people as well about, about access and how, you know, some people say, Oh, don't break in and don't, don't cause any damage. Okay. So you don't want anybody to cause damage, but you're okay walking through that door when somebody else does. Right. So, so everybody who, no one who's, who, uh, nobody who's watching this followed me into, uh, uh, PKW, nobody, right. none of you guys right. followed me in. Exactly. None of you followed me in there. Okay. So yeah, cool. I have some friends that are very, very good at opening locations and whether it's pulling off a window or a board, everybody's like, Oh, oh but let me go in. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a it's such a stupid way of thinking. I, I'm, the first time I ever met people from UER, by the way, there was at yeah. least 15 of us. And it was when I first joined and I posted the hospital, St. P, uh, yeah. St. Joseph's Hospital, and everybody lost their shit. New hospital. <laughs> and like I think it was 13 or 15 people came. And I'm not going to say the person's name, but all of them had been in the conversation about how, you know, doing that is wrong. Getting in, you know, only if it's open. We walk around. My old POE that was there wasn't open anymore. Somebody right. who was very vocal about never doing this walked up, booted in a basement window. Everyone cheered and all 13 or 15 of them climbed in through the window. And I'm standing outside like, these were the people <laughs> yelling at me yesterday about how right. graffiti <laughs> in the building is wrong. I guess let's go back to 2016. And you kind of have already answered this, but I mean, you went so hardcore into the hobby and then just kind of dropped off. And again, you have touched on this, but talk a little bit about that, where uh, where things have sort of shifted for you. Yeah, I mean, we went hard for years and years and years urbexing, and then I had um, I had kind of like if you read through all my blog posts, and there's hundreds of them, it would take you forever. But yeah. it really does read about like a man like becoming self-aware and trying to understand why he's tortured and mm -hmm. working through some of the trauma that happened in my life through that whole process and spending almost two years completely sober. And there was, it was a real self-healing journey. And then as 2016, I guess, came around, I was uh, doing a lot more intense therapies with my therapists, EMDR and all these different mm -hmm. intense therapies and working through trauma. And I started getting, I started compulsively stenciling germ nine around Peterborough, almost as if, um, almost as it was like uh, this claim that I'm here. You know what I mean? I'm not just something that's sick. Like I'm fucking here. And I just right. kind of compulsively did this and it made me, I never used to feel connected to this world, you know? It, and I still sometimes struggle to, but there, there was a time where when I was doing the street art and being out in the whole world, when no one was there and going to all the weirdest nooks and crannies people don't go to and touching the mailbox and doing the, putting the stencils, like there was something cathartic that it, it like, it like confirmed that I was here. I don't know. Some people who struggle will understand that and other people won't. So it is what it is. Um, right. It was like this, this thing, like I'm fucking here. And it was like me continually trying to like say it to myself and force people to see it, like to really validate. And it, it sounds weird, but it was, it was this strange thing that happened. And uh, in, in a way it, it brought me through EMDR and I kind of just shattered the ego. And I, I spent the last few years kind of like a, uh, working through therapy to kind of understand why, why everything really that is me is and uh, how to process it better. And I, you know, I didn't, uh, I feel like urbexing and, and the process of writing about it and all of it was, wasn't really about those buildings as much as much as it was about me processing and processing. And I didn't need that part of it anymore. You know, I was doing this complete right. stenciling thing. And then, um, you know, I started getting arrested on all these charges for doing the street art and graffiti also in 2017, I think, and 18, 19. So I spent a lot of time, you know, dealing with all of that and, and doing more street art and then got back into music and made a new album. So, you know, what I mean, I keep just life keeps happening in waves. You know, I felt that this time, like I was at a place where I needed to, like, get it out again. So I go back instead of street art with the poetry, go into music and 
so it's just kind of the way life ebbs and flows, you know, sometimes it mm-hmm. leads back. I still, I still do Urbex quite a bit. Like I, right. I just, it's not right. like I'm out seeking the hottest locations or giving a fat fuck or traveling for it. I'm just like <laughs> yeah. I'm in Quebec now, I was in Vancouver a little while ago. Like when I'm places I'm out looking around, you know? So yeah. if I see something or I return to all my favorites, but it's just, right. me, it's not about the process or, and for me really like social media, I feel like honestly, the reason, only reason I use social media anymore is like for karma to try to have a way to be positive. You know what I mean? Totally. I get it. Put yeah. positive energy yeah. into the world in moments where I feel like sharing positive energy. Cause other than yeah. that, I feel like the internet and social media are just like this trap that have ruined us. I know I'm going off track, but it's, uh, no, I get it. No, it's fine. No, it makes total sense. It's, it's, <laughs> so, so, so I've tried to stay kind of far away from that. So yeah, that's why I've gotten so far from the Urbex community. Like I don't, I don't really know who's who, who does what, what the sites are, you know, I yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's. Uh, you've you've we've you've kind of wrapped up where I wanted to go with all of this, and so having been through so much personally uh, through the hobby and your life, uh, let's let's say somebody listening right now wants to get into a hobby, whether it's street art or whether it's exploring. What kind of advice do you have through the the experience that you've gained uh, to someone who's looking to get into some kind of a a fringe hobby like what we do? Wow. That's heavy. I mean, everybody's so different. We all, we're all looking for me. It's not necessarily about the hobby. It's like, what do you actually want? Is it a feeling? Is it, is it an emotion? Is it a thing? Is it like, what do you want? What is your, what's the outcome at the end? Like, is it, you know what I mean? Is it fame? Is it joy? Is it love? Like, and then chase that chase right. that and the hobbies will find you along the way at least that's my True. experience it's not about yeah. like i'm a cyclist now i'm gonna go hard in cycling and everything cycling is what i do or urbex because to me that where we're way too rigid human beings were so rigid we we set the lines down and you're like i'm a plumber and now i'm a plumber forever and it's just it's there's, there's more yeah so for me it's not about one thing so i can't really say how to go deep on it for me it's just about more follow your heart find out what it is you want and then chase that like a motherfucker and when anybody mm-hmm. tells you to stop or that you're crazy or you're going too hard or it's risky ignore them tell them to fuck off whatever you have to do just keep doing the thing very good man that's awesome uh, so what i'm going to do i'm going to link your blog down below i'm going to link the documentary video down below and uh, so people can get to know you a bit more if they don't. Make and your uh, album too. Yes, your new album and the old one, which I will say your original album is the soundtrack to my first year of exploring. I listened to that before we met so many times. And now if I put it on, which I do quite often, if I put it on, it instantly brings me back to that feeling of new and exciting nice. and discovering this hobby. And it's, it's crazy. Oh, that. That's awesome. <laughs> Oh yeah, music music captures a moment for you, baby. For sure, yeah. and I will definitely put them both down below, and, and I highly recommend people listen to it and check you out, German. Thanks so much for joining, for opening up with us and talking to us, and let's definitely get together in Kingston and hit that prison together and get you back. Absolutely, man. <laughs> My pleasure. This was fun. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. Take care. Cheers, brother. Okay, guys, that was great. It was so good to talk to my good friend, Germ. Hope you guys liked his interview. Like we said, guys, I'm going to link his uh, stuff down below to his CDs, his music, uh, his website, uh, and stuff like that. Check him out. Uh, may, may not be your thing. It may be your thing. Guys, to me, he's always been good to me. Really love the guy, and uh, I'm glad I could have had him. Now, we're going to do Urbex Book Club time, and, of course, we're going to see what Jeff Chapman has to say about graffiti. Now, Jeff Chapman and I have a different opinion on graffiti. So I'm going to read what he has to say, and then I'm going to give you guys a little bit more of my opinion. So here we go. On page 67 of Access All Areas, if you want to get a copy of this book, there is a link in the description down below where you can go to Amazon and order yourself a copy of this book. On page 67, Jeff Chapman says, Don't bring spray paint or thick markers. Tagging is generally stupid. And people who tag while exploring give more benign explorers a bad name. If you have nothing to say beyond a messy scribble of your name or your group's name, don't say anything at all. When you're exploring, respect the site and your fellow explorers by not marking the place up. Not only does tagging a site increase your odds of getting punished if you're caught, 
It also damages the character of a place and makes it much more likely that the owners or the government will have it sealed. So Ninjalicious is against graffiti. I used to be against graffiti, and then I realized that we're all doing the same thing. Now, while I try my best to leave no trace beyond moving some things around every once in a while, um, some of my favorite photos that I've taken are with are with graffiti in the background or are of graffiti, whether it's a very well thought out uh, statement or a beautifully put together piece of art. Um, graffiti and abandoned places go hand in hand. And uh, it is inevitable. Almost all abandoned places will be found by street artists and graffiti artists. Now, I hate some graffiti. I, I hate the dick graffiti. I hate the stupid nonsense that makes no sense. Some of it is just ridiculous. I do have a great respect, though, for, like I said, well thought out captions, beautifully created artwork. Uh, I think it looks great and it can actually add to the experience of an abandoned building. Um, but, you know, some graffiti artists um, might have some uh, ways of getting into a building and it might be thank you to that graffiti artist that you are able to get in and explore that building. If you're not one to pull off a board, remove a window, find other ways to get in, uh, you have vandals, kids and graffiti artists to thank for your access to that location. So my opinion, before you're so quick to hate on the graffiti artists, think again, about how you have got access to that location because it's probably thanks to them that you are in that building right now. So that's a wrap, guys. That is episode seven with my good friend, Germ9. Very good discussion, some very insightful stuff and some great deep diving into his personality, uh, what makes him tick, what got him into the hobby of exploring and really generally what makes him tick through his life. So thanks a lot to my good friend, Germ, for uh, joining us on the podcast today. Coming up next week, I have two interviews lined up. The first one is with a lawyer. She's going to talk to us about the legalities or the lack of legalities of urban exploring and some of the things that we are going to need to know when we find ourselves in trouble. And then we're going to talk to a girl named Trespass Everywhere. She's going to talk to us about what it's like to be a female in the urban exploring hobby. Uh, she's going to tell us about what the zines are, and she's going to talk to us about the zine that she made uh based around stories and notes and papers that she found in some abandoned buildings. So that's going to be a very interesting episode and she's got some great things to say. So that's it, guys. Thanks for being here. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And uh, see you guys next week. Peace.